Today, an Australian stats fest. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post to covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, of course, at the beginning of the month, we get swamped with lots of data. And I thought it would be quite useful just to walk through some of the main things that we're seeing based on the information from various sources over the last two or three days. So let's get straight into it by firstly looking at the Reserve Bank statistics relating to financial aggregates. This came out yesterday. And they said that total credit grew in the year ended October 21 at 5.7% compared with a year ago at 1.8%. That lending for housing grew at 6.7% compared with 3.3%. Personal credit grew over the last year well, actually in negative terms, down 4.6% compared with 12.9% for the year earlier. And business credit was at 5.3% compared with 1.4% the previous year. So credit is definitely on the way up at the moment. And over the last month, housing credit rose by 0.6%. Personal credit did not move at all. Business credit rose at 0.5%. And overall, broad money rose 0.7%. And that compared with 1.5% in September 21. And compared with a year ago, 8.1% now versus 12% then. Now, if we then look in more detail at the monthly aggregate numbers, this is actually just taking housing for the last month at 0.57%. Breaking it down, owner occupation housing was up 0.73%. And investment housing was up 0.25%. So you can actually see that relative to previous months, there has been a slight decline in momentum, but still in positive territory. Personal credit was at 003 and continues to climb towards stasis. But it's still, if you look back over the last few months, coming from a very deeply negative position. And business credit was up 0.52%, which was actually a bit down on the last couple of months. If you look at the summary monthly data, overall credit rose 0.51%, and that is a fall compared with the last two or three months. And broad money was down a bit, but still up 0.69%. It's been moving around, of course, thanks to all the stimulus and other support mechanisms that have been in place through the second waves of COVID. But the more reliable annual credit numbers shows that housing credit grew 6.72% over the last year, and that puts it pretty much at the tops compared with 2015. Owner occupation lending was up 9% over the year, and again, that's extremely strong. Investment, though, not so much at 2.59% annualised. If you go back to 2015, we were up at more than 10% annualised. So the investment sector is still very, very weak by comparison. Personal credit is still down 4.58% over the year. And business credit is at 5.34%. And it's an interesting rise compared with February-March when it was somewhat lower. And that credit momentum is not bad, but nevertheless it's not necessarily as strong as it was before COVID and if you look back to 2015-16. And if you look at the aggregate numbers, all credit grew at 5.72%. So finally, credit momentum is picking up. No surprise, really, given the very, very low interest rates and the fact that banks are desperate to lend. Of course, they got all that cheap money from the Reserve Bank through the term funding facility. Broad money is at 8.13% annualised, which means that it's still heading up and is still stronger, significantly stronger than credit growth. So that begs the question, where is all the money going? Now, 
We can also look at the authorised deposit taking statistics from APRA. Now these relate of course to the banks, not to the whole market, but they also provide some interesting commentary on what's been going on over the last month or two. And if we look at the statistics firstly on a month by month change, owner occupation amongst the banks was up 0.76%, investment lending was up at 0.23% over the month and you can see there that compared with a few months ago that growth rate is not as strong. In total housing was up 0.58% and in terms of the stock of loans it's a new record 1.9 trillion dollars of mortgages to owner occupiers and investors in Australia and both owner occupied and investment lending rose but investment lending as a proportion of the total continues to fall away it's at 34.31 percent and the other interesting observation here is the mix of portfolio moves for September to October with CBA still leading the charge on both investment lending and owner occupation lending Westpac saw a slight drop in investment lending but a growth in our occupation. The other majors grew both sides of the house as did some of the smaller players and there are a small number of organisations that are close to zero or slightly below zero but not really that stunning at the moment. Everybody's trying to get on the loan bandwagon. But of course as I showed earlier on Momentum is easing and I suspect we may well have peaked with regards to owner occupied and investment lending for the moment. Now let's move on to another dimension and that relates to the GDP numbers and as the financial review reported the economy actually did better than expected. Lockdowns in Australia's two largest cities caused the economy to contract 1.9% in the September quarter but despite being in the midst of a global pandemic, GDP grew strongly through the year. The economic hit in the three months to September was the third worst on record following a 6.8% fall in the June quarter last year, but came in far better than the 2.7% drop predicted by the markets. And in fact, this is the chart from the ABS that shows quite clearly how there was an overall fall in quarterly terms but that the level overall was still up a little bit over the year. Now if you break it down and look at what drove that well there was a considerable fall in private demand in other words consumers and that's not surprising given the lockdowns but public sector was actually still strong and a lot of the GDP momentum was in fact of course supported by public investment and we'll see in a moment also all the supports from government to households and businesses. Now the hours worked dropped considerably thanks to the lockdowns of course lockdowns mainly in Sydney and Melbourne and it will be interesting to see how those trends work later because there are still some signs that some people are not necessarily getting the hours that they want, seeing that in my surveys. The household financial consumption expenditure shows a very significant quarterly fall and an overall level that's somewhat down, not as seriously down as in the first wave of COVID but still down. And in fact you can break it down across the states as the ABS did and they highlighted the fact that New South Wales and the ACT's momentum was different from some of the rest of Australia and of course Victoria is also on the nose as well so you've got to go granular to really understand lockdown versus non-lockdown states is quite significant in terms of momentum. Interestingly the household savings ratio rose again that's because of course people have been unable to spend particularly on services they have continued to buy goods of all sorts and sizes, one of the reasons why there are supply chain issues at the moment. But the household savings ratio rose again, but not as strongly as last year, when, of course, we had the first shenanigans from the virus. But it does suggest that going forward, households 
will have lots of money to spend. Well, in fact, to be fair, there will be some households with lots of money to spend because the point about the household savings ratio at an aggregate level is it doesn't tell you anything because there's about a quarter of households who have done really well and are sitting on very big savings, but there are also a lot of households who are under the gun, have no savings, not even a month's worth of savings, and they won't be able to start spending. And unfortunately, a lot of those is where a lot of the financial pressures are. So unfortunately, this top-level aggregate number really doesn't tell you much at all. If you break it down then and look at what drove household disposable income, very interesting to see that social assistance benefits took another leg up. And overall compensation of employees was just a little bit up, but not very much. And so that's a story of a lot of money flowing from government coffers into households, no surprise, because of the COVID support, and of course the state support via SMEs. Now if we quickly look at net exports and imports, there was a considerable rise in imports of goods and services and a small rise in exports of goods and services. And it's worth reflecting on the fact that we've been quite fortunate with very high iron ore prices and high demand from China. That of course is coming off now. So the probability is that our overseas GDP element is going to take a bath in the months ahead. Unless, of course, China changes direction or we see considerable demand for iron ore. Prices are much lower than they have been. Now let's move on to building approvals of another important set of series from the ABS. And as always, it's very important to break this out. Here, the ABS broke out private sector houses, which has dropped back from its highs but is still relatively strong. That's thanks to the home builder support packages and other government initiative. Investment in units or private sector dwellings excluding houses continues to fall away. So no surprise that approvals are way down. And in fact, they're back down to where they were in 2012, 2013. My expectation is that we will see those continuing to languish because a lot of builders are unable to sell the properties they're already developing, yet alone starting new ones. And buying off the plan at the moment doesn't make a lot of sense given all the stock that's coming on the market at the moment. So you can buy cheaper, older property in the high-rise sector if you really want to do that. So I suspect unless migration taps are turned on dramatically and swiftly, the high-rise sector will continue to languish for some time. Now, if we look at the value of buildings approved by building type, you can see that both the residential and the non-residential fell. The total value of building approvals fell 15.1% in October, and the total residential buildings fell 11.4%. And that comprised a 13.5% decrease in new residential building and a 2.6% rise in alterations and additions. And so that's one other observation that we're seeing in our surveys. A lot of people have decided not to move, but to improve where they are. And that, of course, then begs the question, but can you get the supplies and the materials that you need to be able to make those renovations? <laughs> that is another problem. I think we're also seeing the costs of materials also rising substantially. But nevertheless, there is some momentum in the renovation sector at the moment. Now, just as I go on, I wanted to highlight this because Mortgage Business reported that ANZ has been hit with a class action. There's a class action lawsuit now filed against the ANZ over retroactive interest charged on interest-free cards. The court case is relating to misconduct from the bank from 1 July 2010 to 1 January 2019, and they've claimed that ANZ harmed customers by charging interest on purchases that had been repaid in a timely matter and retroactively charged them interest on what had previously been interest-free purchases. So this is about the way that ANZ calculates interest on its credit cards. It'll be very interesting to see what happens. ANZ will review and comment in due course. But of course ANZ is already under the gun because of the loan introducer issue from ASIC. So it seems to me that the big four 
are being hit left, right and centre with all sorts of bad behaviours and they're coming up to court in various formats now. Now, finally, let's just talk about CoreLogic data because they've been publishing a lot of data today, of course, up till the end of November. The first one is that the new listings rolling 28 national count is significantly higher. And the trend is different. It looks as though the listings will continue higher for another few weeks, which is unusual at this time of year. Normally it dies up till Christmas. But because we've had all the lockdowns, there are many more people wanting to list. As a result of the number of listings, the median days on market, both in the combined capital cities and in the combined regional areas, is somewhat higher than a few months ago. Still down a bit from where we were previously. But as listings rise, wouldn't surprise me to see more properties on market and therefore listing days continuing to rise. They also showed that the changes in dwelling values across Australia in the past month were up 1.3% according to their indices. Of course, their indices are averages, masked a lot of things. Over the last three months, up 4.4%, and over the last 12 months, on average across Australia, up 22.2%. But again, I must stress, that's an average. Not all properties in all locations have risen by anything like that. And unfortunately, these high-level averages actually probably mislead more than inform. Now, they do break it out a little bit, so the combined regionals were much stronger over the last month, 2.2% compared with the capital cities. And indeed, across the regions, there were considerable differences, with regional Tasmania up 2.5%, whereas regional WA was up just 1.3%. And across the main centres, Darwin was down 0.4% over the past month, but is still up 16.7% over the last year. Whereas Adelaide was up 2.5% and 21.4% over the last year, and Brisbane was up 2.9% and 25.1% over the past 12 months. Interestingly, both Melbourne and Sydney were pretty weak up 0.6 and 0.9% compared with what they've seen over the last year. And Perth was only up 0.2% and is reported at 14.5% over the last year. But again, I need to underscore that if you look carefully at Perth property, this is not uniform trend. There are areas where prices have moved up a little, but there are still many areas in the West where prices are still well below where they were 10 years ago. And in fact, I discussed this with Louis Christopher on a special show on Monday. Go check that out if you want more information on Perth. Very interesting information from Louis. This is the aggregate monthly change, month over month, both combined capitals and combined regions. And you can see there that the capital's rate of growth is easing, although combined regionals are still quite strong. It's a very interesting question now as to whether that will continue. Will people still want to move to the regions? There is a lack of supply in those areas and people are paying top dollar, whereas property closer into the capital cities is certainly more available. But again, this is an aggregate number and it doesn't tell you very much. You really need to break it down into units and houses to see any meaningful information. And then just look quickly at CoreLogic and the annual change to rents. Houses definitely rising. Darwin up, although coming back a little bit. Sydney at 10% higher. Canberra at 8% and Adelaide at 9%. Brisbane at 11% and Hobart at 13%. But of course, these are average for houses. Uh, units not so strong. Again, it's very interesting to see the differences. Sydney up 6.8%, but I can tell you that not all units in Sydney are rising, particularly those in some of the high-rise areas and in the high density of development. Melbourne's at 1.7%, Adelaide's at 6.1%, Darwin's at 16.9%, and Hobart's at 12.6%. And I would make the point that if you go back a lot further, you'll see in fact that those rentals in the West are still somewhat lower than where they were 10 years ago. So as with all of this information, you need to be careful about how you interpret it and don't jump to the wrong conclusions. I do have a problem, frankly, with these basic indices that really tell you very little because of there is a lack of granularity in the information. 
and that means that averages mask, and that means that you can be persuaded that things are somewhat better than they really are. Just remember, there are still a number of places where property prices are significantly lower than they were in 2017. The archetypal example that I keep using because it's true is North Rise High Rise, and they are down considerably about 26% from where they were in 2017. So as with all of this information, it is really, really important to take the information to understand where it's come from and how it's derived, but also to draw the right conclusions, not the wrong conclusions from this sort of information. It makes such a difference when you interpret it. And lastly, gross rental yields are also reported by CoreLogic. And this is a very cautionary tale. Remember that gross rental yields is the combination of the price of the property to buy it and the rental return when you let it. And it shows that in Sydney, the average gross rental yield is now 2.4%. That's lower than Melbourne. That is remarkable. It used to be the other way around. Melbourne used to be the most weak rental yield. Now Sydney has taken its place. Brisbane is a lot stronger, 3.8, Adelaide 3.9, Perth at 4.4, Hobart at 3.8, Darwin at a massive 6.1. We can talk about that at another time in more detail, but that really is because there isn't a huge supply. There is quite a lot of demand. And people are paying quite a lot more than they used to. Canberra at 3.8%. But it's also worth noting that the regional numbers are significantly higher. So regional New South Wales at 3.7%, Victoria 3.6%, regional WA at 6.1% and regional Northern Territory at 7.3%. So many locals are being priced out of the regions now thanks to many, many years of poor policy failure. And the national gross rental yield average is 3.2%. And the combined capital cities are 3% and the combined regions is 4.2%. These numbers show that property investment is certainly not a lay down mosaic. And my analysis suggests that about 60% of property investors are underwater from a cash flow perspective. So if I look at not gross rental yield, but net rental yield, that's after the cost of the mortgage and paying for repairs on the property and other things too, management fees, for example. So property investing is certainly not a dead cert at the moment, and that might shock some people. But as I said, not all prices are rising, and not all property is let, and not all rents are actually covering the costs of the property. So if you are considering a rental property as an investment, make sure you do your homework, do the math, and that includes considering all the costs of coming in and going out. And frankly, don't be misled by the so-called tax breaks because they are becoming more marginal for many people. And I have met a number of people who use the tax break as an excuse to hold property. Well, at least I'm getting a tax refund. But when you actually take it apart and show the total cash flows, money in, money out, they are quite surprised. No surprise then that around 30% of property investors on a net rental yield are severely stressed at the moment and therefore are considering needing to sell their investment properties. One more reason why property listings will probably continue to rise in the weeks ahead. So there you go, a quick run through of some of the latest statistics. My take on all of this is one, go granular, two, don't be misled by the averages that everybody is spooking in the mainstream media. And three, things are on the change. Credit is easing back. Interest rates are rising for some people. And probably listings are rising. And indeed, even the NAB is now suggesting that next year there might possibly be a property price correction of some sort. Not a big one, but enough to notice. So possibly... We are at peak property. And going right back to the GDP numbers, we have benefited, of course, from very high resource prices until recently, but that's changing now. And it'll be interesting to see what happens ahead, whether our GDP number continues to grow. 
bearing in mind that there are so many households who are underwater in terms of cash flow and hours worked. And bearing in mind that those savings ratios that are highlighted at the beginning are also likely to get spent quite quickly. And once they're spent, they're spent. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.